Okay, now this lecture, it's not like my poor past or anything like that. It's about looking at lifelong learning from my lifelong learning. Okay, and um, so I'm going to go back in time here. On, and what I want to talk about what I didn't learn in school. So a lot of things have changed over the last 50 years. And this is just some of them. So personal music, use iPods. Um, we had LP records. I had a slide roll. We'll talk more about that. Cell phones instead of landline phones. Teletype instead of Twitter. Punch paper cards instead of memory sticks. Paper. Maps instead of uh, GPS maps and Google Earth and and ways. Uh, diapers, cloth diapers. Probably not many people in this room remember cloth diapers. But I can tell you it's an experience you wouldn't forget. Because cleaning, taking dirty cloth diapers and cleaning them and washing them is something you don't want to do. Reading materials, books, newspapers, printed encyclopedias. So when we did research, we had to go to the library. Because the only way we could get references and books was go to the library. So things are very different, but I'm going to talk specifically about how we do calculations. So 1961, that's me, no laughing. This is my car, my first car, 1953 Ford convertible. Mine didn't look quite that way. I only paid $35 for it. I paid $85 to have a new top put on it. I went to Rutgers University. I grew up in New Brunswick and went to high school in New Brunswick and went to Rutgers, which is also in New Brunswick, the State University of New Jersey. And I started with a slide roll. Now, you have to think about this. You do, you've never used a slide roll. But to do all my calculations, all my tests, I had to use a slide roll. It's the only tool I had. And that became very difficult sometimes. I mean, there's no chemical engineers in here, but if you're doing a distillation column, the numbers get very small as you approach the equilibrium, and so you have to do it by hand, because you can't do it on a slide roll. There's only three decimal points, maybe four. And then you have to keep track of the, where the decimal point is by using powers of tens. 1965, I graduated. I had a 57 MG at that time. And I went to work for Lever Brothers Company in, in Edgewater, New Jersey. This is the headquarters of New York. And Edgewater made soaps and detergents. And so I worked in kind of process and product development on soaps and detergents. And I stayed there for 10 years. And a lot of the technology I learned was at Lever Brothers. We had mechanical calculators instead of a slide roll. I'm going to demonstrate this for you. And imagine now you're in an office full of these. We didn't have a lot. Clear the registers. Now let's try a large multiply. Let's go four, four, five, five, six. Seven, seven, eight, eight. Multiplied by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. Hit the multiply. And clear. We had computers, we had punch tape. Uh, GE Basic was one of the first computers I used. 1969. That's me. That's four generations of McMahon. I'm the one in the middle, if you can't tell. 
<laughs> Not the little one, the bigger one. Had a TR4A with IRS then. And I went to graduate school part-time at New York University. So I spent seven years going to graduate school. At night, I took one year off leave of absence. I think that picture was taken when I was off on my leave of absence. I learned Fortran in college, my grad in master's. Uh, and Fortran, we had to punch our own cards. So you had to you know, write the program, punch your cards, and then in order to get the cards run, we had a van that left from the research center to the city of, in New York at four o'clock in the afternoon. So I'd put my cards in nice, in the right order, send them over to New York, and they'd run them at night, and I'd get them back at eight o'clock the next morning. So if I made any mistakes, either in programming, but more likely in punching my own cards, that was a whole day. So I had four days to get my program right. One of the things I was interested in there and learned about that we didn't cover in school was spray dryers. They made powder detergents this way. And my goal or my objective was to try to get better control of the moisture and the density of the powder coming out of the spray dryer. So I instrumented everything, uh, the liquid feed, the air, temperatures, the dry solids. I had instruments on all of these different things. And I had one of the first magnetic tape data acquisition systems. And so we, I would run these and we collected a data uh, about 30 uh, points per second, which was really fast at that time. Again, I had to have punch cards that I would write. I'd send the punch cards and the magnetic tape over on the wagon at four o'clock in the evening. They'd go to New York. I'd get it back, and first I would convert the millivolts to engineering units. I'd go back and I'd run again. I'd run SPS a regression analysis on the data to look for matches between uh, different data and the outcome. And I was able to find we had huge piston pumps about that big that would pump the slurry up to about uh, 500 PSI. And what I found is that the whole thing cycled depending on how the pump cycled. Because it was, it was just three, three strokes going like this. And that all related to the, everything that was happening in the system, which I wouldn't have been able to find without this magnetic tape and the high speed data. This is my first calculator. I was in graduate school. It added, subtracted, multiplied, and divided. I had to plug it into the wall, and it cost $115. What it did really well is did it to six decimal points, which is what I needed for my research. 1974, I had a Camaro, and I started working for Sunoco Products in, in uh, Hartsville, South Carolina. Now, Samoco Products made packaging and tubes. And so I worked in product development, and I also did adhesive coatings and resins at Sunoco Products. This was my first computer. It was kind of cutting edge at the time. It was a Commodore 64. It was portable, kind of. It was about the size of a big briefcase. And it had a screen that was four inches. And it was colored. And that was pretty unusual at that time. Now, if you wanted to do word processing on this, you would have to type in what you wanted, you know, what you're going to put in. There's no spell checker. If you wanted to do bold, you'd have to put a character before the, the word. And after the word, you'd put a B to make it bold. And if you want to underline anything you want to do, you had to manually format. I was working at, when I was working at Sunoco, I was working with the Canon Corporation, making toner cartridges. Went out to California, and I had to make a telephone call back to the office. 
And on the desk was this Apple computer. And the person's desk I was using asked me if I'd ever seen one of these. And I said, no. And he said, and he plugged in this uh, guided tour that Apple had built in. And there was nothing like anything that I'd seen before. And I looked at it and I said, I want one of those, right? 1984, I came to UTC. I had a van at that time. None of my fancy cars anymore. I had a family, right? So I came to UTC, 1984. We had IBM machines. In 3850, what's now 3850, we actually had a lab where we taught computer uh, word processing uh, and we taught uh, it's what's now Excel, only we taught WordPerfect and Lotus123 because students coming in didn't have any experience on these. We had a VAX here and then I got my computer. It had no storage space. In fact, mine didn't even have a hard, it ha I had an external hard disk, I had a printer, and this little computer, which was 512K, I paid $2,500 for it. And then I got an, a bigger Mac, actually I called it Big Mac, because it was 40 megabytes. And that's a whole operating system and everything in 40 megabytes. And I got a Newton. A Newton is kind of like the precursor to the iPad in a way. It, didn't, it wasn't successful, but it had a lot of features that I really liked. I actually wrote a database, I could write a database on the computer. I could put the database on the Newton and I could do work on the Newton and then transfer it into the database on the computer. So it was very portable and very powerful because we didn't have any direct internet connection. 1993 was a big year for me. Um, I got married. My wife is here. I had a VW camper. Drove the Florida in the VW camper, but had a a blowout on the way. And then I went to Cambridge um, to their design center and worked in the design center, which made a whole lot of difference in what I did. I worked with a woman from the Netherlands in the design center, and we worked on something I showed you early in a semester, or early last semester, was the matrix model, the model of design. And I've stayed with that matrix model since then. And I used it on a, another Macintosh. I had set up a server and, a, and internet, and I developed an online design system. Uh, most of that I learned from scratch, how to do a database, how to set up the server. And kind of when we moved to this building, things didn't work too well. I don't know why, but at the time they didn't work well. Then I got a Windows computer. I still have it, I guess. Uh, it's a, my first Windows computer. Now people are going the other way. I don't understand it. They kept, for all these years, they tried to convince me I need to wait, move away from a Mac to a Windows computer. So I finally got one. And then we got into doing online courses. Uh, using MediaSite, I also do online courses in Adobe Connect which is, I think, better for my applications. Currently, iPads, Surface Pro. And we get into the microcomputers, which I don't really know that much about, except people use them in my design projects. And so they decide we're going to use a Raspberry Pi. And then they say, no, we're going to switch to an Arduino Black. I don't know if that's right. And I don't know why, so I ask them why. And they say, well, it's more powerful, it's quicker, whatever. But it's kind of, that's the end of my technology, I think, right now.
Now I'm driving a Prius. <laughs> so my career started when calculations were a major part of doing engineering. So we graduated. We thought engineering was about doing calculations. Took a long time. I've learned how to use new technology and learned how to apply that to solve problems and improve performance. I always wasn't on the cutting edge, but I was pretty close. I was usually an early adopter of technology. I went to some seminars, some workshops, but most of what I learned, I learned on my own. Not much direct application of what I learned in school. I learned a lot of things in school, but I didn't really apply, apply it that much. What I applied was having those tools to be able to learn on my own. And I continue to do that and will, will continue. So I'm going to play you a video of, uh, this was actually TEDx. Um, I was nominated to do a talk, so I made a video. The video kind of took a turn more, less from TEDx to more, a more personal look at things. As I approached the elevator on my way to work, I had a flashback to when the elevator buttons were high. The problem was people in wheelchairs couldn't reach the buttons. So designers created a number of innovative devices for people in wheelchairs so they could reach the buttons. People in wheelchairs got tired of the adaptive devices and collectively said, the problem is the buttons are too damn high. When the problem was defined this way, the solution was obvious. Working with designers, architects, and the government, the buttons were lowered so that everyone could reach them. You ask now what? A few years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. In the time between the call from the doctor and the beginning of the treatment, which in my case was surgery, there was plenty of time for reflection. The experience led me to ask similar questions in retrospect and then looking forward. What do I want to do with the rest of my life? In retrospect, I had spent 19 years in industry doing product and process development and 30 years teaching design, product development, and innovation. When I look back on these years, one thing that stands out is the more than 100 projects aimed at improving the lives of individuals with disabilities. My answer to what do I want to do with the rest of my life was to improve the life experience of the older adult population and persons with disabilities. Now what, for me, is expanding our community efforts to address social problems. My vision is a sustainable nonprofit, a hybrid model that develops products and services that may be not-for-profit or may spin off for-profit products or services that solve social problems and support the nonprofit. Where does innovation that benefits society begin? Just like the elevator buttons, it starts with a process of putting the user first. It starts with not assuming the problem and designing for the user, but listening to the user to gain insights and define the problem. This can be achieved through open innovation, or maybe more exactly, user-driven innovation, where we observe the user to gain new insights that define the problem. One model that would support user-driven innovation is design thinking a model from the D School at Stanford and IDEO. Instead of the voice of the customer, design thinking is based on empathy with the user, questioning, observing, and experiencing the users in their environment. I like the word empathy. It puts the user first and implies a closeness with the user. The observations, questioning, and experiences are converted to insights. Insights define problems based on the user input. As I mentioned, my particular passion is a nonprofit to enhance the lives of the aging. Consider, for example, a preliminary study where we looked at the eating habits of the older adults. We talked to the elderly. We observed them in their homes and in the grocery store. We developed insights and identified problems. The problem was thought to be a lack of knowledge of healthy eating. The reality was that they bought prepackaged meals 
and cooked in a microwave or ate at low-cost fast food restaurants. They knew this wasn't healthy, but reported it's hard to buy and cook for one person. You have to eat leftovers or waste food. With age, it becomes more difficult to prepare meals from scratch. Cooking takes a lot of time. Cooking is not convenient. Healthy foods cost more money, and it may be less expensive for one person to eat out than to cook. The problem is more like, how does one conveniently prepare healthy, low-cost meals from scratch with little waste for one or two persons than a lack of knowledge of nutrition? Social-based innovation requires a different mindset, designing with the users, not for the users, designing with, not for. Designing for people in wheelchairs created an adaptive device. Designing with people in wheelchairs lowered the buttons. Designing with creates a product or service that creates value for society based on the user's needs. Now what? is user-based innovation that works with the user to develop problem definitions and solutions for the benefit of society. Let us, as a community, expand our approach to innovation. Let's define innovation as designing products and services with the user to enhance their lives and maybe even make their lives more worthwhile. Okay, so I mentioned in there design thinking. This is a model of design thinking, and this is what I'm currently working on. So design thinking, we said, starts with empathy, define a problem, ideas, do quick prototyping, testing, and repeat the process. Also, I mentioned, I mentioned these in my class, uh, a business model canvas, which is a lot simpler and more practical in terms of using for the initial prop, uh, initial designs of, of products, use an open innovation to get the user's input in terms of not only getting their ideas about the problem, but also using the users in creating ideas and, and always getting feedback from them to make sure that the idea is really what the user wants, not what the designer wants. And then finally, something I haven't talked to the class about is Agile. Agile is a way to develop products uh, that's a lot quicker, shorter term, make sure you get things done. So now it's 2016. So what's next? Florida? Fishing? My MG? And my nonprofit to work with people, not for people. Where will you go from here? Most of your focus so far has been on learning materials to pass the test, get a grade, get out of here, graduate, right? You'll need to learn how to apply new technologies to problems and improve performance. Many resources are available now that weren't available when I was coming through school. It works about applying what you learn to solve problems. It's more like design than the, than the analysis classes. I believe that there's a need to focus on innovation. A lot of things, what I had major problems doing calculations, you don't have those problems. In fact, you'll probably have less and less of them. But innovation is something that's valued, uh, will continue to be valued. You must be willing to learn on your own. 2016 is your start. Where will technology take you? What's the future? I have no idea. I mean, trying to project the future from now forward for 50 years is pretty daunting for me anyway. So this is something about you be able to touch your cell phone and feel things on the other end. So it's up to you. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to learn? So thank you very much. I'll take questions if you have any. Yes? What was our favorite device to work with? You know, you were showing all those different devices that you were using. What's your favorite? I, 
had the calculator, the yeah. computer, which one's your favorite? Well, my favorites are probably the newest ones because they do more. Uh, but I, ha I really liked the Newton, even though it failed. Uh, I liked the Newton. I, had, uh, I was able to do a lot of things on the Newton. The only problem with the Newton, you had to have a, learn a special characters to write with. To write with the pen, you couldn't write the regular letters. There were characters you had to learn. Anything else? Well, I'll just do away from convertibles. Pardon? Why do you steer away from convertibles? Steer away from them. Seems like you like them back in the day. Yeah, I still have a few, a couple. Yeah. The MG I still have. I have. This is a 62 MG. Yeah. If I get some time, I'm going to get them back on the road. Especially in Florida. But probably not in the summertime. Any other questions? All right, this is probably my last lecture as a faculty, yes. I have a question. Yes. So Dr. McMahon, if you can go back and say, if you can sit on one of these seats that these students are sitting, what, what would you do? What would I do? Yes, what, what would you do or ask differently or um, what would be the recommendation for the students who are sitting in these seats? If I were to... Well, there's a couple, if I were to do it differently, I would do some kind of internship or co-op. Because when I went to graduate school, it was a lot easier for me because what I learned, I could go to work and I had it, I was able to see the application directly of what I was learning in school. In undergraduate school, we learned about a lot of things, like a centrifugal pump, but I had never seen a centrifugal pump. I had no idea what a centrifugal pump was. So it was all just looking at the equations I was going to use, but I didn't really understand the physical part of it. And for me, the physical part's important for me to learn. So that's probably one thing I'd do. The other thing I'd do is I'd change my career. Um, now, there's a thing I found out working with this person from the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, there's something called a product design engineer. And what they, it's like five years and they do uh, industrial design from an art point of view. And then they do the engineering part. So when they design a product, it's both the industrial design and the engineering have to go together. Any other questions? So this is probably my last lecture um, after many years. So, uh, and I've enjoyed it all, and I'll still probably be doing some adjunct work, but in terms of regular classrooms, this will be my last lecture. So thank you very much. <laughs>